Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Just Egg. You can't have plant-based breakfast without a plant-based egg. You can get started with a free sample. Just head to ju.st slash hrn. This week on Meet and 3, we rethink surplus by exploring how innovators are promoting sharing mindsets and responding to excess in creative ways. The whole life cycle of food would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind China and the United States if it were a country. You know, in the age of COVID, where a lot of those institutional processors did grind to a halt and a lot of farms had to dump milk in Pennsylvania, even while supermarket cases were, were bare, the organic market stayed strong. They source all of these ingredients, they do all of this work, and then they just boil it for a few minutes and then they throw it away. Tune in to Meet and 3, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Cooking in Mexican from A to Z. I'm your host, Aaron Sanchez, alongside my beautiful mother, Sarela Martinez. Wonderful. Today, we're going to be talking about edible bugs in Mexican cooking, and we have the top authority in this subject matter. And let me tell you, we're going to have a lot of fun. We are so honored uh, to have uh, Mark Moffett joining us. He is an ecologist storyteller. He's a tropical biologist who studies the ecology of tropical for- forest canopies and the social behavior of animals, especially ants and of course humans alongside of that. Mark received his PhD in organism and evolutionary biology from Harvard University, not too shabby, and, in research, and also a uh, research associate in the Department of Entomology at the National Museum of Natural History in, in the Smithsonian Institute. So uh, he's also, uh, in 2009, he helped curate the uh, exhibition for Farmers Warriors, uh, Builders of the Hidden Life of Ants, Open at the National Museum of Natural History in the Smithsonian Institute, containing 40 or more of Mark's images. Wow, check that out. And Mark is a lecturer for the National Geographic Society. I can go on and on and on. The gentleman is a lot of fun, and he is commonly referred to as Dr. Bugs. All right, so welcome, Mark. We're, de- we're delighted to have you over the moon. Aaron, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, always pleased to talk about insects. Uh, uh, whether we're eating them or not. I mean, I like them both ways. I like to watch the live ones, but I also respect them as part of cuisine in many parts of the world. So I, we can talk about all kinds of stories. Mm. That's wonderful. That's that's wonderful. I mean, I remember when you when you published your book on ants. Remember, we had we already knew each other. That was a long time ago. Yes, yeah, right. And I used to uh, pop into your restaurant, and you're always in the back, and you would often have special things waiting for for Melissa and I. Uh, uh, I think insects you were able to buy in a market in New Jersey, some legitimate cuisine, Mexican cuisine, you'd work up just for us, not the other customers. Um, mm-hmm. I, have, I have a funny story about that, but I'll, I'll wait until later to tell it. Yeah, I, I think there's something to mention. While we're going to be on the subject of edible bugs and Mexican cooking, that's what we're really going to dive into today. Uh, you know, a couple of facts here. Most of Mexico's edible insects are, are caught wild. They're not farmed. 
then sold at regional markets or trucked into the larger cities. I think that's important to mention. Uh, there's not like, you know, this typical ant farm. They are ant farms out there, obviously, but for the majority in Mexico, they're caught wild. Uh, let's go down some of the list, shall we, Mark and Mom, about sure. which are the ones that are used commonly and eaten in Mexico. Let's start talking about gusano, shall we? The most common, I think people, you know, they have that um, that image of that that, that, that shitty mezcal with the, the maguey worm sort of uh, festering on the bottom. And from my understanding, that was just done as a marketing tool to get gringos to, to taste crappy mezcal. Uh, what, 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 what are your thoughts on the maguey worm? I don't really have many thoughts. I don't really know if they do add to the flavor. I haven't tasted with and without. Maybe we should do kind of some kind of a research project there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it may be mostly for fun. I uh, I had a similar thing in uh, China where I actually bought some ant wine, which had uh, uh, polyrachis ants at the bottom smashed up. And, uh, you know, I don't know if they really added anything to the wine, but the label for the wine insisted that it, it improved your good looks. So, you know, I still tried it. But uh, in both cases, I think it's more marketing than uh, uh, savor, uh, savoring the flavor of uh, the bug. Well, you know, yeah. in, 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 in right now, they were telling me that in Oaxaca, the gusanos and maguey have taken off so much that they're restricted now. You know, the, yeah. the sales are the, the sales are controlled because a lot of people are using it. Mostly, well, people usually uh, serve them dried and smoked, maybe. You know, but mm -hmm. and, and and put them in in sauces or the, or in salts. And because there's the mezcal is often eaten with you know drunk with uh, salt and and now they combine it. Yeah, in oranges they're combining yeah. the the ant. The, I mean the worm, uh, you know, ground up with the salt, and they sell it, you know, to to eat with a mezcal, to drink with a mezcal. So it's like yeah, uh, and I think the invasion. reason because of that, mom, is because the interest level in mezcal has grown exponentially, and people are starting to drink more mezcal, and then also understand to pair it with the maguey salt, which helps take a little bit of the edge off and gives this very earthy tone. Uh, and then mixed with the orange, it's just a beautiful combination of sourness mm. and, and, and kind of bitterness as well. So, yeah, that's really how they're used. The maguey worms are considered grubs. Uh, so, you know, they yep. can get nice and plump and, and juicy and fat, and they kind of explode in your mouth when you have one. Mm. Uh, yeah, not for everybody, <laughs> but definitely a great source of protein. Yeah, yeah it's true of bugs, uh, uh, grubs generally. They have a lot of, I mean, insects in general have a lot of uh, nutrition, but they also have a lot of flavor. And it's always interesting to see how people respond negatively when they know what it is, but can actually get really excited about the flavor of the food when they're ignorant of what it is. I mean, people have this psychological barrier uh, that uh, is thrown up, which is really kind of bizarre to me. I mean, you can, if you're in the right, uh, if you're in the right frame of mind, you can say that the hamburger at your local shop is great and so forth because your friends all eat there and so forth. But if you blindfolded someone and gave them that hamburger and compared to anyone else's hamburger, they'd go, this is terrible. But yeah. we psychologically build up these preconceptions uh, for social reasons that don't have anything to do with the quality of the food. And that really shows up a lot with when we're talking about insects or spiders or other kinds of food. Mm -hmm. I have a beautiful story to tell you. I think you were actually at this party when I, when I gave that party for Oliver Sacks for his Oaxaca book. And mm -hmm. I served this potato cakes with this worm sauce. And, and when I went to serve it to Oliver, he said, and what are those? And I said, well, these are little potato cakes with some worm sauce. He says, we're eating worms? You know, he loved all that kind of stuff. And I said, yes, we are. And I said, shall we tell everybody? He says, no, 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 let's just keep it to ourselves. <laughs> I love that. Worms are also great sources of protein. And we'll, we'll talk about this uh, as we move on. But you know, some of these insects are used as um, protein substitutes in vegan flours and batters, which a lot of people don't know that when you're having you know, that little sort of pancake mix that's supposed to be vegan, a lot of times there's there's dried, ground up insects in there. Yeah, well, it's a, 
it's uh, it's useful to know these kind of things because, in fact, I have a friend in the Department of Agriculture who once told me, you know, we can't exclude insects from human diets because they come into different kinds of foods. And if you work out the math, the average American eats about two pounds of insects a year, just <laughs> tiny bits and pieces. So if you don't like insects, don't eat raisins. You know what those little creases are in the raisins? You don't know what's down there in those raisins, but in a lot of other things. The hops of beer have a lot of aphids in them. And uh, so and it's, it's, these sources of food are actually quite healthy. When we look now at uh, COVID coming out of the the kingdom probably from a bat or something, and things like mad cow disease and uh, chicken flu and so forth, things that are related to us, the things that we generally eat can transmit things to us because they have similar genetics. Insects are unlikely to do that. They're likely to be much more healthy, both because of that and because of their nutrition. Uh, they have yeah. less bones and inedible matter. Uh, they're just basically a raw protein uh, and really delicious, as we said. They are. Do you know that book that I sent you, all those pages that I sent you from that book? Yes. And, uh, and, I mean, she was my hero. You know, and I and I actually got to spend time with her in Mexico City, and she was like 98 when she died recently. But she wrote a book about feather art. She wrote a book about convent food. You know, she she was this amazing, amazing uh, woman. Zarella, yes. So this is this is a published book in, in Spanish, obviously. Is it still available, or is it? Well, I sent you a link. I couldn't believe that there was one for sale for forty four dollars, hardback on Amazon. What is the book? Who's the author's name? And, and all that for our, for our listeners. Okay, it's, it's called Presencia de la Comida Prehispánica. You know, the, the okay. food is about pre-Hispanic food. And there is, a, it, it, by Teresa Castelló de Iturbide, she was related to the Viceroy, you know, Agustín de Iturbide. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she, and, but the book was published by Banamex, you know, it was one of those holiday gift that books that they, be, beautiful books that they produce. To, for the big clients who give them away or sell them or whatever they do. So but anyway, it's it, it, there was one available on, on, on Amazon yesterday, or the, yesterday right. I think. That's awesome. Um, well, let's move on if, if we can, just because we have, we, have, we have a lot of things, you know, it's been bugging me because we have a lot of different <laughs> bugs to go over. So I just, I, oh, dude, come on, I, I was waiting for uh, oh. the right time. Anyway, <laughs> the... Um, Let's talk about chicatanas, no, shall we? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Bugs. This um, this is the year that they, they come out after being dormant for 17 years, correct? Like they're expecting a huge a huge proliferation of chicatanas this year, no? Yeah, well, it's a particular species that comes out every 17 years. There's another one that comes out every 13 and so forth. And they're to the uh, nature lover, they're quite exciting because they, they all give that... Uh, Call, love call together and uh, it's mm. a summer of thrills for us other people might find it a bit uh, annoying or terrifying but they're harmless insects and they are in fact uh, very edible uh, they spend the vast majority of their lives underground as little larvae so they have just one flight of fancy to find the female for a couple of weeks <laughs> every 17 years talk about a hard love life um, yeah. But they are, you know, uh, generally roasted, right? And uh, yes. yeah, well, you know, in in Veracruz, they're huge. They they are roasted and they made it into the sauce. But it takes a while to get used to it because at the, when they first come out, it kind of has like a urine smell, you know. So, but I just read the most fascinating thing in in this book that I told you about, where you know when they're going to come out because they start cleaning their their the entrance to their to their what do you call it nest look like a burrow yeah, yeah nest yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and and they clean and then they decorate they make the entrance bigger and then they decorate the the entrance with with green leaves which mm -hmm. i think is i think that's amazing and but they come out and when the first rain hits every year i think it's every year there and the, the 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 thing gets flooded and they have to come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every year down in the tropics, generally many of them come out every year. Up here, they're what they're doing is they're trying to uh, flood the predators, so no predator can con uh, can possibly eat them all if they come out suddenly and all at once. So it's a strategy of survival, and uh, 
uh, down in the tropics where things are uh, more steadily, steadily in terms of temperature and conditions, uh, that strategy is less common, but you still see it sometimes. So that's the biological explanation. But it's just a, a strategy for the love life that I don't think I want to try. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like teenagers on spring break. You know, they're seventeen and they're going out there to chase love. You know, um, and the chicken. But you only get one chance. You get only one shot at exactly. <laughs> so we're we're talking about the chicatanas, of course, the giant winged ants. Uh, they yeah, they do come out in the first rains uh, of the season that hit Oaxaca, and then uh, they're typically roasted. Um, you know, and, and lime is added, and then they're ground into a paste with chili, salt, and garlic. Uh, they're added to moles as well. Uh, the sort of the salsa that you can tell us kind of resembles a tahini. Um, and as my mom said, they can be a little bit off putting with that that's that flavor. I wouldn't say urine, mom. I would just say earthy. That way, <laughs> <laughs> that way we can so we don't dissuade our listeners. You know, do you, do you remember that story when when I had that uh, chicken with the anato paste and marimba and the woman said, well, how, how does it taste? And I said, well, it's very earthy. So then mm. later on, when I went to the table to check and see if she had liked the chicken, she says to me, yes, I loved it. It tasted just like dirt, just like you told me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move on because we're going we're gonna to save ants to the end. Okay, Mark? So you can wax oh, poetically. Oh, tasty stuff. Yes. We're, we're going to leave that to the end cause we, so you can wax poetically off of that. But right now, I want to talk about an interesting bug that I think you also know a lot about, Mark, obviously, are escamoles, right? Now, escamoles are one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to eat. I, I find it a huge delicacy. Every time I have escamoles, I tend to be in Mexico City for whatever reason. I always find them there. Um, they're, 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 they proliferate heavily in Puebla between March and May, uh, which is the, the escamole season in that particular part of Mexico. They're ant eggs. That's what we're talking about. Let's, let's expand a little bit about that, Mark, shall we? Well, ant eggs are uh, actually really a pure t type of uh, food. And so in different parts of the world, uh, I sent uh, Azarella a video of uh, Cambodia, where there's a whole uh, village that focuses entirely on collecting ant legs to make omelets. And the omelets are healthier than chicken omelets. And uh, you can buy these eggs in the market. And uh, they are are very rich uh, flavored, not like the adult ants, which are spicy, uh, mm -hmm. but definitely good for you. They're a little tricky to collect because the ants don't like you taking their eggs. So if you are <laughs> not fond of ant bites, you might find it a bit uncomfortable. You might leave that to somebody else. You know that they told me, I read one of her description of the escamoles is looking like a puffed rice. Yeah, well, that's, that's what they certainly look like. Yeah. Yeah, and they're very creamy. Uh, of course, you know, if you go to Mexico City, there's a very famous pre-Hispanic restaurant, Fonda Don Chong, that, uh, you know, specializes in pre-Hispanic food, and they tend to have escamoles quite often. I've had them actually uh, with, in a taco, very simply with guacamole, um, and just that beautiful combination. They, they're, they kind of creamy, cancel each other out. You have the creamy guacamole and avocado with these creamy escamoles, and it just makes for a really wonderful bite. Uh, ant eggs. How about humiles, honey? What's that one? Humiles. They're a big delicacy, and, and, and they're very, they, they, they grow on trees, and they sell them alive in little leaf packages. Mm -hmm. And people eat, eat, either toast them and, and, and season it. One favorite thing to do is toast them and combine it with chili. And into a salt, like a seasoning blend that you can that you mm. can put all over. Just Egg is now the fastest growing egg brand in the United States. Bring more plant-based consumers in your doors with easy-to-use Just Egg. You can get started with a free sample. Just head to ju.st slash hrn. That's ju.st slash hrn. Made from plants, Just Egg is a better egg for you and for the planet. It's healthier with no cholesterol and less saturated fat, and it's more sustainable. Just Egg uses less water and generates fewer carbon emissions. Most importantly, 
it's delicious. For our listeners who operate a food service establishment, you can get a sample for free. Head to ju.st slash hrn. That's ju.st slash hrn. Just Egg makes a delicious plant-based addition to any menu. It's available as a liquid scramble. Great for omelets, frittatas, stir-fries, and French toast. There's also a frozen pre-baked folded version that's ideal for filling breakfast sandwiches or topping salads. Chef Jose Andres calls Just Egg mind-blowing, and Bon Appetit says, It's so good, I feel guilty eating it. Put the fastest-growing egg brand on your menu. Get a free sample of Just Egg for your restaurant at ju.st slash hrn. I think we should just touch upon this because it's such a novel idea of fly eggs. Okay. Now, um, this is something that is considered, you know, Aztec caviar, believe it or not. It's cultivated a lot um, in Mexico City. Um, you, could, you can imagine, you know, uh, Tenochtitlan back in the day, Aztec, Aztec people were eating fly eggs. I've, I've had them actually in cakes where they've taken mm-hmm. the fly eggs and they've, and they've kind of cooked them down and then made these almost little fly egg cakes. And they were actually very delicious. Uh, do you know anything about that uh, by chance, Martin? No, I haven't uh, heard about that in Mexico. However, this is one of the uh, few European instances of eating insects. There was actually something down in the uh, parts of Europe called walking cheese that was popular for a long time. has gone out of popularity, I'm afraid. And <laughs> that was cheese that would move across your plate because it had live uh, larvae in it trying to escape you. Uh, so the youngsters aren't taking to that anymore. Uh, well, maybe, there's, maybe there's still a possibility of retaining that kind of cultural purity in Mexico. <laughs> Well, they are. They do. They do. They actually do sell those things still in Oaxaca and Mexico City as well. Yep, and uh, they're actually um, they're kind of popular also in in Michoacan, from my understanding as well. Um, all right, so we we talked about Mr. the novelty water fly eggs, right? <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about champurines, shall we? Oh my god! All right, we're going to talk about grasshoppers, okay? And then oh, we're going to move into yes. ants. Okay, now let's go. What do you, so let's open it up for champolinas, everyone. That's that's the first I- insect I ate. Well, no, I, mean, I used to eat the acorn worms too because at the ranch there were acorns, and you'd bite them. Sometimes you'd squ- squish into the little worm, but the but the grasshoppers are fabulous. They go out into the field to catch them, and in nets, and early in the morning or in the evening, and then they come home and put, pour boiling water over them to kill them hmm. and wash them. And then then they let them dry, and then they saute it with, in lard or oil with garlic, chili powder, and, and lime. And that's mm-hmm. how, that's one of the ways that, that they're, 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 you know, they're um, sold. But then, those are the really little ones, but then they also do the, the bigger, like beetle, you know, the, the, the bigger grasshoppers, and. And they dry them out, and after they kill them, and then then they they are sold in one piece, you know. So they're mm. it's quite a crunchy little delicacy. Ah, uh, yeah, and I, I think you've had you gave us uh, some of those at least once at your restaurant when we dropped by, and the grasshoppers are among the most tasty insects, and uh, uh, one of the most universally liked. Uh, insects to eat, uh, grasshoppers, kickets, crickets, cica- uh, katydids, that general mm. family of things, uh, and they they do have that kind of nutty crunchiness to them if you cook them the right way. Uh, do Mexicans eat uh, termites? That's something that's commonly eaten in Africa because they have those big termite mounds. I don't know mm. if they eat termites. I don't know if that if if, if it's by that name. But I'm seeing one right here in the middle of the wood. It's 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 called a chinche de monte. I guess we do. But it, mm-hmm. it, it, probably it, somewhere. What what is the botanical name? 
uh, the the, na the zoological name. Uh, well, just uh, termites are in English termitidae. So yeah, it's. Uh, termitidae. I would suspect you eat them somewhere. In fact, you know, I, I should mention that I was at a conference once in China. Uh, the conference was uh, alternative foods for a sustainable future. Nice. And so the Chinese invited me to Beijing, and it was co-hosted by the Italians and the Chinese, and they were continuously arguing about pasta because the Chinese couldn't <laughs> believe the Italians did this to pasta, and the <laughs> Italians were disgusted by what the Chinese did to pasta, but the actual... A conference was on things like uh, who eats the most insects, and guess who eats the most insects around the world? Chinese. Nope, not quite. No, the Thai. The Thai matched the Mexicans. Both of them ate uh, something like a hundred species, uh -huh. and so both the Thais and the Mexicans ate a great diversity of insects. Yes, it was also a. I got that mark. I get a gold star, man. They also had a session on who eats rat. Oh. And, uh, you know, I, I've had a little rat myself. There's a story there which I can go into. But uh, it's, let's just say that rat is a, a sustainable food source, particularly <laughs> perhaps in New York, if you wanted it to be. Uh, yeah. I just I just saw a rat in the subway and it was so brazen that it was just sitting there looking at me and a guy <laughs> turned the corner and he saw the rat and he leapt up in the air and the rat leapt up in the air under him and so they did this marvelous leaping thing it looked like a dance and it was the greatest thing i'd seen in new york uh, in the whole covid period and i congratulated the man on his great rat dance afterwards and he was quite pleased with himself so it has nothing to do with food but i thought i'd mention it well ap apparently there's there's eight rats to every human in new york city so just just to uh, a, a fun little fact there but yeah mm. um I think you mentioned the idea of, of grasshoppers. Look, I go to Thailand every year. That's why I know that. It's inevitably uh. that you go to a market. Uh, if you go to Chako Chak Market in Bangkok, you can see a whole area of just insects, sold live, dried, any, any way you can imagine, they got them. So, yes, there's a lot of kinship between the Thais and Mexicans, I guess, when it comes to consuming insects. Uh, yeah, the chapulines, is, you know, they're typically used, as we said, you know, you go to markets in Mexico, you find them in different sizes and different kind of almost weight categories. They could be very small and kind of feeble. Then you kind of go into the middle ground and then you got the big suckers that are kind of, uh, there's a little more challenging to eat. <laughs> but at my restaurant, Johnny Sanchez here in New Orleans, by the way, 930 Poitras, in case any of you guys are interested. Oh, please. <laughs> we do take out, by the way. Um, we, we, you can have our guacamole uh, with or without champolines, with or without grasshoppers. Uh, and it's, yeah, so just, just if you want to have a little bit of, of fun. It's really just like eating a, a, a lobster. I'm really surprised people are familiar with eating lobsters, which are much bigger and yeah. just as weird looking as any insect. And so it's certainly a psychological barrier that's actually hard to explain because a, a, a large grasshopper and a lobster are not that different. And the grasshopper may have actually more edible food if you've ever struggled with a lobster. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you know, in, in the turn of the 20th century, prisoners were giving lobster. It was so plentiful as a, as a meal, believe it or not. Lobster yeah, was, that was, was a given away. Change in attitude. And we're yeah. probably, you know, we're gonna, I think we're going to have to go that way s to some degree just because uh, eating insects is a far less uh, disastrous to the food chain, to the environment, and so forth. So in the long term, whether we like it or not, uh, we're going to change our diets and actually we'll end up liking it. And it's going to be, uh, I think, going to just be good all around. I was reading that most insects have about 95% pure, uh, pure protein. Yep. Yeah. So if you go to Australia, for example, Australians are f familiar with this whole idea, even those from Europe. So you'll walk along in Australia up in Queensland and one will say, hey, do you know these ants? And they'll reach up and pull off this little green ant and say, Try one, and they'll just eat it. So, you know, it became an everyday thing for Australians to take on what was originally this aborigine uh, piece of their diet, and uh, it's, it's good for you. And frankly, honeybees. Okay, mm. we're eating honey. This is bee vomit. I don't know if you really want to hear that, but, you know, they're regurgitating this stuff. So come yeah. on, lighten up about insects. They had a, a wonderful anecdote here. Uh, what, uh, there's a variety 
event that all they eat is honey. And they, they go back to their to their nest and they and they give their honey mouth to mouth to the other worker ants who who then go put them in a like a storage area and then they dry out and, and the, the people there get a, a, a tree tree branch that has resin on it and put it in, in the nest so that they, the, the, the honey ones adhere to this nest and they sell them you know, to the stick and they sell them in the market. And people have, wow. them, and people have them as candy, you know, because they're so sweet. And then they actually, after they dry off, they're sold, you know, sort of loose as candy. Wow. Awesome. Well, actually, I got, I got to throw this in. There's, in the Bible, there's something called manna, manna from heaven. Yeah, 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 manna yeah. is the, the sweet uh, excretions of a kind of an insect that the, oh, wow. uh, they used to eat in uh, the Middle East. And so oh. it's right in the Bible. So let's talk about your love affair with ants, Mark. And when did that begin? Because I know a lot of people have that fond memory of an ant farm. I think this generation does not know you know, how cool an ant farm was, because I had one, and I just, I could sit there mesmerized looking at the ants all day. Basically, an ant farm is like a little piece of, two pieces of glass with different kind of sand and different things. You can watch the little ants burrow and, and create a little colony. Where, did, where What happened to, where, where did your love start with it? Well, I started uh, as it did uh... For, for with you, Aaron, it's, uh, or Zarella, probably when you were like in diapers mm. at the age of six months out in the backyard watching things, we all started off watching ants. And why did we do that? Because ants are always doing stuff. They're mm. not just sitting there like a dog uh, <laughs> licking themselves once every half hour. <laughs> Or most other animals. Have you ever tried watching a cow very long? Most large animals are boring, but ants, they're fighting, they're building highways, they're retrieving things, they're working in groups, they're having warfare. Ants are cool, and they're really a lot more like humans than you we give them credit for because we are expected to outgrow watching ants, and I showed commitment. I did not give up. You know, you guys are failures because you stopped. So that's my story. And I just kept watching ants and my parents go, you sure this is a paying job? And I go, well, um, and so I sort of how I convinced them anyway. And so I've mm. continued to watch ants and I've continued to be thrilled by their, their the similarities they can show to humans and the, their industry and their their uh, and all the ver variety of behaviors they show and their tastiness in the right places absolutely and ants are found all over mexico incidentally uh and as well they're kind of they they're kind of treated in the same way a grasshopper would be where there's different uh weights and different sizes of them available at marketplaces and, and mercados um Let's talk a little bit about how ants are used, Mom, in, in, in different dishes in Mexico. Well, I think most of, most of the ones that, I, that I've been reading about is they either are put into a sauce, like a, like a you know, with, with, a, mm -hmm. with tomatillo, let's say, for instance, and, and maybe some guajillo chili. So mm -hmm. that's one way that they have them. Or toasted and, and ground up and made into the spice paste. Or, mm -hmm. or like the escamoles are actually cooked in, in red chili sauce or green chili sauce, you know, some of those cooking sauces like the, like the caldillo, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that type of thing. And seasoned, you know, and served with tortillas. I mean, that's basically the way that they're used. I mean, some of them are sold individually to eat as snacks. Yes, I'd like to use them. I think they're a great textural uh, component to a dish as a garnish for a taco, for instance. So uh, are these ants, uh, the kind of rusty red colored ones that are that collect the leaves? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those leaf cutter ants are actually eaten famously down in Colombia, and you cook the big, the really big ones, the queens. Do you, mm -hmm. do you have those in Mexico as well? Which are uh, roasted and are kind of nutty flavored as well. Yeah. Yep. And then, then in Venezuela, they have uh, if you go to the average restaurant, they have a little bottle of hot sauce with ant heads at the bottom. Those are the same ant, and they add a lot of spice. You know, ants have that formic acid when they sting you, and that's actually spicy, like uh, citrus. And so it oh. adds a lot of pizzazz to things. Uh, so 
um, those kind of ants, those leaf cutting ants, the ones that carry the leaves around, are the most popular <laughs> foods uh, among uh, Latin Americans, I think, generally. Probably the same ones in Mexico, but I bet you probably eat some other kinds of ants as well. I don't know. Wow. There are a big variety here in the in this book. Yeah. 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 I love that. No, no, but they're basically all prepared kind of the same way. You know, toasted and, and ground up or toasted and so like S's or toasted and boiled. I don't think that there are many things that they just add the worms to, the live worms to, the sauce to. Have you heard, have you seen that? No. No, I have not, Mom. For our listeners out there, because now after after hearing this very intriguing podcast, which I hope we've done a good job of describing a little bit of sort of the the variants in the in the insect world of edible insects, how they how they relate to Mexican cooking, Mark, what is what would be your suggestion for people to seek out uh, the hump, the comb cook? How can you get your hands on some bugs, some edible bugs? <laughs> well, uh, I'm no expert there. I do know that when I see these things. In restaurants in the States, they're often sort of a, a gimmick. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like going to China and ask, and going to a remote place and asking for a hamburger. You just don't do that. So yeah. it is something where it really pays uh, to really know the cuisine as it really is to visit Mexico. So I think everybody should escape COVID um, lockdown and get down to your territories there all as soon as possible uh one of the great cuisine areas of mexico for sure but uh here in new york uh, i mean you can you can cook various things with mealworms uh, you can go uh, away from insects and and look at earthworms i've had to eat those in a couple of trips when we ran out of food and you know they can be quite tasty <laughs> as well uh, yeah, I have a good story or two about that. It takes too long. Uh, we were stuck in the bottom of the sinkhole for three days. And uh, anyway, um, wow. I, I've, I've never tried cooking insects myself. So I would suggest I will give uh, Zarela's number at the end of the podcast <laughs> and you can all call her up. Yes. Uh, if you bring me the insects, I'll cook them. Yeah. yeah. I think even in Mexico, even one of the least likely sounding insects to eat, the stink bug comes yes. up every once in a while because what is it really is pungent. It'll add a, a knockdown flavor to things. You don't want to add too much of it. But I know people who study flavor and odors and, you know, the stink bug flavor, the smell that you smell in a stink bug is the same smell as cut grass. It's just highly concentrated. So you cut that back enough and you can do all kinds of things with it in a cuisine. And Mexicans, I think, uh, include some of those in their diet as well. So... Anything. You can try all kinds of things. I just learned a word from you. But the thing is that I, when you were talking about the smell of grass, I just learned a word that I'm crazy about. It's called petrichor, which is the smell of, of rain and the, the, uh, the, the earth after the first rain. Is that not a fabulous, fabulous word? That is a great word. And it probably could work in a cuisine somewhere, too. Absolutely. I mean, there are 88 different species of edible beetles in Mexico. Just to uh, to kind of bring you up to speed on that, the, uh, the, the, the name for the edible beetle is called, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it looks like a Nahuatl word, uh, Chawi, Chawi. Um, yeah, Chawi. Um, it almost has a little bit of a fishy flavor. Uh, they're also called Escarabajos, Escarabajos. Escarabajo. Which the, Escarabajos, uh, which, uh, yeah, which would be the big like a scarab, mm -hmm. exactly. They're typically found in, in places like Hidalgo, Tabasco, Guerrero, Veracruz, Oaxaca, Puebla, Chiapas, and, and of course, Nayarit, in case you were wondering. And you know so what they do as well? Uh, the, be the bigger beetles and scarabs, they make them into jewelry. You know, yep. you'll go, you'll, you'll go oh, and, then, yeah. and then they have the, the little crystal eyes and everything. It's, it's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. Yeah, you see those in museums, even, some of the classic pieces of jewelry, the uh necklaces and so forth now mark can you tell our listeners what you're working on any projects how they can get in touch with you and engage with you yes my uh website is www.drbugs doctor spelled out bugs mm -hmm. so you can figure out how to contact me there so i do all kinds of things i'm a explorer so i go around the world uh looking for strange and weird creatures i'm very good at finding them i publish a lot of things in national geographic but i also look at the 
social lives of different creatures. So I've had a book, uh, Zarela Knows, Adventures Among Ants, and another one now on uh, the human swarm about human societies and how societies stay together and fall apart, and things on rainforests and so forth. I am a... Uh, I'm an escape artist. If you want to get out of town and uh, do something cool, that's uh, you talk to me. I, I figure out how to do that. Uh, unfortunately, this whole uh, COVID thing has slowed me down quite a bit. I'm supposed to be in West Africa right now, darn it. So never mind. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. I would like to get down to Mexico as well. Even Mexican Mexico City has some fabulous, of course, restaurants and things, and uh, I've never been. Well, we'd oh, really? love to take you. Uh, I could take you down there as well, uh, uh, Dr. Bugs, Mr. Senor Mark. Uh, will you be open to doing uh, guided tours to some of these, these locations? <laughs> well, uh, with a small enough group, a lot of these yes. things are kind of kind of tricky if you have more than uh, six or eight people. Okay. And uh, certainly uh, uh, studying... Uh, the cuisine in Mexico up in the mountains and some of the areas you you guys uh, know well uh, would be an intriguing thing for me. So maybe you should do the guiding or maybe we can both do the guiding and I can yeah. point out the monkeys. You, you can point out the spices. So uh, there that you would go. work pretty nicely. I remember one thing that when you proposed to Melissa. Yes. Oh. That you said, she said, why should I, why should I marry you? And you said, because I will make you bring your coffee every day to your bed, and I'm going to take you to places that you will never be without me, be able to go without me. Uh, I have done that, and I've really fallen short the last year. She, we've been all stuck in, in the same apartment, and Melissa works in the medical industry. So she's been manning the phones, trying to get uh, all the things going for doctors to work out. And I, you know entomologists aren't very useful right now, I found out. <laughs> so I'm just making the coffee. That's all I'm doing for the moment. But I'm, I'm gearing up for some expeditions again and, and writing some things and uh, and just to hopefully, hopefully things are going to get back to normal uh, with as the summer progresses now because I'm ready to go out and try some great restaurants, even in New Orleans, by the way. Well, please come down and visit. We'd love to have you. Uh, I have a, I have extra space at my house, so you can, you're more than welcome to stay with us. You know, the Mexicans invented mi casa su casa. That's not, you know, the Swedish didn't come up with that. Okay, so we're very awesome. we're very open to having guests. Um, and I want to remind everybody, all of our listeners, uh, how to get in touch with with Mark Muffet. Uh, you can uh, reach him at mark at drbugs.com, and doctor is spelled out as he said. Or you can go to his website, www.drbugs.com. And please, uh, we really encourage and implore everyone that's listening to support Edible Bugs and, 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 and support them and seek them out. Go to markets on your travels and bring them back with you. Put them in your suitcase. And bring them back and enjoy them, because that's how I get my, my insects back from Mexico. I literally am, am, am a bug mule. I'm a mule that, that brings bugs across country lines. So oh, make that's... sure that you guys do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying you here first, Mark. Well, fabulous. I'll meet you at the airport next time. <laughs> we'll have a shady transaction at, at the luggage department. You know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll exchange bugs. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Mark, you know, for joining us. I mean, I haven't laughed this much in probably the whole year of COVID, you know, so... I really, really appreciate you coming here and sharing all your wonderful knowledge and, and making me laugh. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm bored with serious peepers, people, Zarella. Let's go find some fun ones. <laughs> Gracias, Mark. Everyone, again, we, we've been talking about edible bugs in Mexican cooking. Uh, our guest today, Mark Muffet, uh, just an amazing gentleman lovingly known as Dr. Bugs, please seek him out. And, and please seek out more uh, more episodes of Cooking in Mexican from A to Z on Heritage Radio Network. Thank you so much. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritageradionetwork. 
Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. <laughs>